hello, I am Logan Plaster, editor of Startup Health Magazine, and I have the pleasure of chatting today with Liz Tucci and Paulina Hannon, two of the authors behind Startup Health's recent Q1 2019 Health Innovation Funding Report. Looking at the report very quickly, we see $2.9 billion in funding, more than double where we were at in 2014, and yet very quickly when we dig into it, we see a lot of nuances to those numbers, a lot of stories beneath the story. So uh, with that, I'm gonna jump in and let Liz start by telling us what she sees as the biggest headlines from this report. Right away, one of the things that, that stands out is the drop in deals compared to the start of last year. If you look at Q1 2018 compared to Q1 2019, there's about a 35% drop in the number of deals. It does look like a, a slow start, but it's actually not as concerning as it may appear. Um, actually, from Q4 2018 to Q1 2019, it's flat. Um, and although the, the number of deals is smaller, the median deal size actually increased by almost 80%. Um, and then when you look at the amount of capital raised, it is a less than 4% difference compared to the start of last year. Paulina, what should we be paying attention to in this report? Yeah, so it's uh, interesting uh, that the funding was flat, but it's still $2.9 billion. That's still a fairly significant chunk of change that has gone into uh, the health innovation landscape as a whole, which is fantastic. And there's so much more to be done. Uh, one of the other things that we saw was how diverse the top deals actually were. So we track something called functions, which I think we'll probably talk about a little bit later. It's effectively the main activity or the value driver of the company. And across the top deals of this quarter, eight of the 10 functions that we track were represented from population health to administrative workflow. So traditionally, we've seen patient empowerment as being the one that is invested in most frequently. But this quarter, wellness actually uh, went up to the top. Five of the largest deals within this quarter were from the wellness function. One of the deals was a company called Calm. It's an application for sleep management and stress reduction, and the company raised $88 million this quarter. It's pretty significant. So anyone taking a look at this report is going to notice that um, it has taken a shift away from digital health, the term digital health, uh, towards a focus on health innovation. I think it's going to be significant for anyone who's been in the market or has seen our reports before. So maybe you could explain uh, why is that important and why why did the report make that shift? It's uh, it's a really good question, and particularly because many within the industry as a whole still view digital health itself as a sector. We believe that the term digital health is actually outdated because there are so many. Uh, applications uh, that we have, uh, we all have our phones, what, uh, in uh, our back pockets are on our desks, so we have access to a variety of different platforms. And as we just talked about, wellness uh, has, uh, is up. So that means that patients are starting to own their own health. Um, more importantly, things aren't going to stay digital for a really long time. It's just going to be health. And so to have that kind of terminology, even today, just seems outdated. So that was one of the main reasons that why we wanted to focus on health innovation as a whole, rather than the standard terminology of digital health. Yeah. And more importantly, these are really, really big problems that we are trying to solve. At Startup Health, we look at the long term. 25 years from today, not just what's going to happen next year. So, which is why things like funding being flat over a quarter is it not necessarily that phasing because this is going to take a long time to transform the health and wellness industry and health innovation industry as a whole. And you have to do it in a multidisciplinary fashion. So we're no longer looking at really small subsets of markets, but we're actually starting to look bigger. So what is it going to take from an entire health innovation space in order to cure disease, in order to end cancer, in order to unlock the mysteries of the brain? It's not going to take just one digital health technology. It's going to be a completely holistic approach where we're starting to look at companies that 
ordinarily wouldn't have been considered digital health, but are absolutely part of the health innovation landscape. I, it is an interesting challenge that the uh, telemedicine industry has faced over the years as they dealt with the issue of uh, telephonic medicine versus simply virtual care over any platform from now for forever. And there are whole organizations dedicated to telemedicine who I know have had to really uh, face the fact that telemedicine equals medicine. And it's just the, the, the method, the, the cables over which it's delivered. Um, it's an interesting linguistic challenge. Liz, what do you think? Yeah, absolutely. And to Paulina's point about uh, the convergence of, mar of markets, um, DNA Nexus was one of the largest deals of this quarter, uh, for example, and it's a company that provides um, a global network for sharing and managing genomic data. Um, so traditionally, this company would not have been looked at as a digital health company, um, but is doing work to achieve the, the moonshot of curing disease. So this is a good example of investors who may have originally identified as biotech investors um, that are now investing in digital health. Very interesting. So you started to touch on this a little bit uh, in terms of methodologies, but there are a lot of insights reports. There are a lot of reports in the market about uh, digital health, um, about health investing. And uh, this report has clearly taken a, a shift in methodology in how the market gets parsed and um, explained. And uh, if you could talk a little bit about what makes the report unique, uh, I think that would help our, our viewers understand it a little bit better. Yeah, it's uh, something that we did a lot of thinking on and it actually is something that was started last year uh, when we changed up our taxonomy of how we view this marketplace. So because we view companies and this industry in a holistic fashion, we didn't want to relegate ourselves or the companies that we are following and tracking into just a single spot, into a single um, subsector. Uh, for, uh, for instance, if you look at our reports like 2013 or 2014, and many reports from that time, you'll see something like big data. Well, big data itself isn't a market. It is a tool that is utilized in order to achieve something. Same thing with patient engagement. Patient engagement as a whole is not just a concept. It is a, um, an application that is utilized in order to cure a particular disease or to be able to achieve something broader and grander. So when we recognized that, we thought that we needed to we look at the way in which we categorize this market. So we actually broke it down into six different components that allow us to look at this data in a much more um, in a much more forward thinking way, but also in a much more long term. And to kind of break that down even further, the six attributes that we um, tag each company with are the function, which is the company's main activity or value driver. Um, the clinical specialty, such as oncology or cardiology, um, who is the main end user for the technology, what is the technology type, um, and what is the application. So uh, what are the use cases for this company's technology? So again, breaking this down for each moonshot gives us a better look into not only how much capital has gone into the moonshot, but what types of companies are, are raising um, money. And it also allows us to, to spot uh, places where there may be a lot of innovation or areas where there's not enough innovation happening. Mm -hmm. So for instance, maybe you're kind of seeing a lot of different new news cycles that come across for mental health, but what are the actual technologies that are being developed within it? Do we have the entire spectrum covered that is necessary in order for us to, to allow people to achieve their best potential? You mentioned moonshots in terms of one of the six ways that we categorize companies. The report really seems to uh, hone in on these big audacious health goals and how funding funnels into them specifically. And uh, the biggest section of the whole report is about moonshots. And uh, it, it really seems to have surfaced some new narratives within those subsectors. And so I was hoping you guys could tell me, um, you know, what was uncovered. Walk me through a couple of the stories 
that the moonshot focus allowed um, us to tell the world. Breaking it down this way definitely highlights the maturity of some of certain moonshots, such as an access to care or cost to zero, um, which have each raised roughly one billion this quarter um, over about 50 deals each. And breaking it down this way really allows us to see funding that funding over the last five months has been consistently within this range. So those really stand out as as moonshots that are mature, um, but it also highlights moonshots that require a bit more innovation, um, such as brain health, children's health, um, and addiction, for example. Um, so to dig into the addiction storyline, this is the biggest quarter uh, we've seen in the addiction moonshot since we began tracking. The amount of capital raised in 2019 has already surpassed the total uh, raised in 2018. However, when it's next to something like a cost to zero or a cure disease, you can really see how much room there is for innovation within this moonshot. You know, capital raised by by addiction moonshot companies only represented about 2% of total funding. Um, so again, you can really see how far along some moonshots are and how much more work there is to be done in others. Paulina, if someone reading our report might see the access to care and the cost to zero moonshots, um, and they might, um, they might not fully understand kind of how those categories work for us. I think children's health, women's health are, are more self-explanatory as to what kind of companies get bucketed there. But to see access to care and cost to zero be um, so dominant on our list, I wonder if you could just give any commentary, a little bit of uh, explanation about those moonshots, why they are so big, kind of what they cover. So when we started to track uh, this data uh, going back to 2010, that was around the time that conditions that within this industry, particularly in the United States, were set in order to accelerate innovation. So we already talked about um, the access to devices, access to devices, mobile devices, uh, things like that. But on top of that, you had completely changing business models. You had a rise to uh, of costs to deliver care and just so much waste within, uh, within the industry as a whole. You have a, an aging population and you actually have a rise in the ability for entrepreneurs to develop technologies really easily. So many of the entrepreneurs that came into the space saw this is saw these really big challenges that were literally right at their doorsteps. Either the entrepreneurs themselves came from the healthcare industry where they recognized that one of the biggest issues was access to care, was the notion that you had these rising costs. So was the fact that you had a aging population, you had immense uh, issues within chronic disease within this country. So it was easy to start to develop within these sectors. And this is why so much funding has gone into the moonshot of access to care, which we define as a belief that we can deliver quality of care to everyone, regardless of their location or income. And the same thing of cost to zero. Uh, we don't obviously don't believe that healthcare as a whole is going to be free and have zero cost, but the incremental cost of delivering care should not be as expensive as it is. So you have so many entrepreneurs that are focusing on these really big moonshots that are invariably going to be affecting some of the other ones as well. And there's a couple lines in the report that really stuck out to me talking about new business models. And when you talk about bringing the cost to zero, it just makes me think about how creative we're gonna to have to be uh, to find ways, new ways of, of paying for things. Yeah, absolutely. And this is primarily why you no longer can look at this industry as digital health or as healthcare IT or as healthcare services or as biotech or as life sciences. And you have to look at it holistically. You have to understand what are the really big problems that affect billions of people around the world and collaborate together in order to not just innovate on the business models, but really come together with the unique capabilities of every entrepreneur and every investor in order to be able to achieve the moonshots themselves. That's our time. So I want to really thank you guys for taking the time to explain the report. Liz Tucci, Paulina Hannon, thank you very much. 
Uh, just a reminder to those uh, watching this online that you can download the full 20-page report at startuphealth.com slash insights. And then we encourage you, once you've read the report, once you've uh, discovered these different narratives, these different moonshot stories, come join the conversation on Startup Health HQ, where there's a community of thousands of um, what we call health transformers who are, who are engaged and collaborating on these different health goals uh, globally. So please join us on health, uh, Startup Health HQ and continue the conversation. So thank you very much.